So I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this interesting uh, conference. And I should apologize because the title is out of date. The correct title is this, it's Adjusting Counting Indicators Curve Space Times. And it refers to my recent, uh, actually quite out of the oven, because I uploaded it yesterday, uh, article in uh, which I try to take classical defined counting indicators and to reformulate them in a way that they should be appropriate in uh, the framework of general relativity. But before we begin, okay, let's discuss what is chaos. This is a definition given by Devani in uh, 1988. 1989, sorry, and it says that a dynamical system is chaotic if it's transitive, uh, the periodic orbits are dense, and it's sensitive to initial conditions. I could explain these terms uh, in mathematical definitions, but I would prefer to use a simplistic analogy if by taking dough, pasta, chesto, if you will. And if we put a little bit of grains in a part of this pasta as initial conditions, and we start to kneading, stretching and folding, stretching and folding. This is basically, if you uh, know what's asymptotic manifold, the stretching and uh, folding is what asymptotic manifold does. So if we stretch and fold, stretch and fold, and we do it in a transitive way, then in every corner of our pasta, we'll get a grain. This means that our system is transitive. The second is the dense. If every neighborhood of this needed pasta, we find another grain, this uh, means that our uh, periodic orbits are dense, okay? And if I do the same thing several times, and I get another result, then first I'm a bad baker, but secondly, the system is uh, sensitive to initial conditions, okay? Because every time I get something else. However, the third concept is basically a result from the first two. If, if the system is if transitive and it's dense in, uh, by periodic orbits, then these authors proved that it will be sensitive to initial conditions. So the most renowned characteristic of chaos is basically a result of its uh, basic uh, feature. And this sensitivity to initial condition, however, is very useful to detect the chaos. So our motivation is to take such indicators, which are based on the sensitivity of Initial, on initial conditions, and to reformulate them in a way that they, they will be appropriate for curved space times. And why should we do that? Because uh, in uh, classical mechanics, when we define the maximal point of characteristic exponent, the deviation vector which measures how two nearby orbits diverge is measured uh, in, uh, by Euclidean norm. And the time is a universal parameter. However, in general relativity, 
coordinate part, uh, coordinate time is part of the coordinate system, and the norm is space uh, time dependent. Let me show you an example how we can destroy chaos. If we take the maximally Apuno characteristic, characteristic exponent, then if it's positive, we get chaos. We have seen this in uh, Andre's uh, talk. And if it goes to zero, then we have order. If we take this simple time transformation, then exponential growth will become uh, annihilated, and this uh, new maximum lapun of characteristic exponent, MLCE, if you want, will go to zero. So we have a question now. Is the existence of chaos dependent on the coordinate system or not? Uh, Motor in a, seri a series of papers have shown that chaos is independent. And basically he showed that uh, maximum of uh, MLCE keeps its side. However, sorry, uh, this is still a little bit strange from the physical intuition because you have a physical quantity. Chaos is measuring how fast we lose, in, uh, lose information. It's, not, it's a measurable quantity. For example, if I give you not right now a number with many, num uh, with many digits, a Lapunov number will be the number by which you will start to forgetting these digits. It will be the rate. So it's physical. It cannot uh, depend on whether we are in uh, one coordinate system or another, and the uh, value can fluctuate. So we have to find a way to define it and as absolute value, which doesn't depend on coordinate systems. Uh, Sota et al. propose in the framework of geodesic orbits such a formulation. He basically suggested that we should use as deviation vector this quantity and uh, as time parameter the proper time. And then the wall indicator will be independent of the coordinate system we choose. But this is not the only one, uh, but the only suggestion. In a uh, more recent paper, Wu et al. suggested that we can do it actually more simply. Uh, first, we can drop the this term and leave, make it a little bit more simple. But this has a shortcut because we're leaving out the velocity part. So we are not anymore in the phase space. We are basically in a configuration space, in a subspace of the whole phase space where the deviation ve a vector in classical mechanics is defined. The second is, he said, OK, why should we uh, really bother about integrating this? It's much more complicated. Let's do something more simple, which actually was the thing that in classical mechanics was done until, the, until now, but it began about 70s. They, they don't really take the deviation vectors, but they took two nearby orbits. The orbit which we want to uh, investigate, and a shadow orbit. 
and by the distance of these orbits, we could again define a new deviation vector. However, this has a drawback again because if we compare the method A with method C, we can see, this is from their work, that C is very close but not identical to the, uh, the one to the other. So we have not, again, a invariant measure of chaos. I will use the Sota et al. approximation because I find it more appropriate. And I will define all the integrate, uh, integrators by this, uh, by Sota et al. Re uh, recipe. And I will apply them on the Manco Snabrias Gomez Manco space time, which is basically the space time around a rapidly spinning uh, neutron star. Uh, the good thing about this is that uh, it has been proven that this system is non integrable. Okay? So, my first example comes uh, for this uh, Poincaré section we have with gray points denoted the uh, chaotic motion and the black points denote the regular motion. We can see that the maximal Lyapunov of characteristic exponent goes to zero in this log-log scheme of the uh, MLC with proper time, and the chaotic motion goes to a uh, non-zero value, as you would expect. This is nothing new. This is the definition that Sota et al. gave 15 years ago. The new thing is the FLI, which has been used by shadow orbit approximation, the two ne uh, nur nearby orbits approximation. However, it has been not tested yet with the Sota et al. The FLI is basically in the simplest form this. And we have to run a preliminary test to find out which orbits are regular. In a, this plot is the black one. And by a, in a given time, we can see where this uh, the maximum value of the FLI, where this curve has stopped. But because we have, can see the, these oscillations, we cannot use the maximum, but we have to at an arbitrary constant. Let me explain a little bit about the oscillation. Uh, if we have a torus, the torus is not a direct uh, product of uh, circles. This is a little bit ideal. It's, in the best case, a product, a direct product of ellipses. This means that if we have a deviation ve uh, vector, it will stretch and shrink according to the deformation of the torus. So we get these oscillations. Okay? So in order not to characterize uh, a chaotic, no, a regular orbit as chaotic because of this oscillation, we have to set a arbitrary little bit semi-empirical value and add it to the maximum value of the uh, regular orbit at a given time, and then compare the other orbits to that value. If the other orbits are bigger than this value, then they are characterized, characterized as chaotic. Otherwise, they are characterized as regular. Another indicator is Megno which is defined by this theoretical, let's say, 
uh, formulas. Basically, this has very large oscillations, which I, sh I will show in the next uh, slide. But this one is more smooth and more well behaved, this average. Numerically, in GR, we can reformulate them like this. And we can see that the average Megna will go to 2 for regular orbits and will greater than 2 for chaotic orbits. Uh, in a recent work, this is done, uh, this example is given by the SOTA et al. Uh, recipe. In a previous work, uh, Sukova and Samarak has used the shadow orbit and except from that, they used an approximation of the Megno, which is defined by the FLI. So uh, there is a work that combines these two integrators. And in a good approximation, the Megno is expressed by uh, this difference. If we take the Megno without the averaging, we will get these ugly oscillations. If we average it, we get the blue line. Uh, and if it's chaotic, it goes to infinity, basically. Uh, I must admit that I find these results quite surprising, because the shadow orbit, which is very uh, approximate method, gives the same results that we will expect for exact method. And I think a uh, future work will be a comparison of these methods. Uh, another uh, indicator which threshold is uh, theoretically defined is the apple. And this is basically the, if you want, the FLI divided by the uh, logarithm of proper time. And if the orbit is regular, it goes to 1. If it's chaotic, it goes to infinity. And in order to avoid some strange numerical, uh, let's say, in infinities, because if proper time goes to 1, the denominator will be nullified and we will get an explosion at 1, we can make this trick, which has no uh, really impact on the result, and we can recalculate the whole thing more smoothly. Uh, this, uh, this indicator was designed to find power loss during the, uh, the chaotic development. It was, let's say, uh, there was some suspicion that in weak chaotic layers, there is no Kolmogorov synaiotropy. Uh, there, was, there was some suggestions that there should be the Tzalis entropy. And Salis entropies uh, said that in the region of weak chaotic layers, the deviation of vector should not grow exponentially, but following a power law. In our investigation a few years ago, we saw that this is real, but just by coincidence. Just the, numer the numerics give a power law, but this is a little bit arbitrary and it's more a numerical coincidence than a physical, uh, let's say, motivated uh, reality. So, the last uh, indicator I'm going to talk about is a, is a smaller alignment index. This is a totally different case from the other four indicators. We don't care about the growth. 
the exponential growth of the deviation vector. We basically even uh, nullify this growth by taking normalized to unity deviation vectors, which these are the Ws. And moreover, we take not one uh, deviation vectors, but two, in order to be uh, able to see if this initially uh, set by different with different orientation deviation vectors will become parallel or not. The idea be uh, behind the Sally is this. If we take two deviation vectors on a torus with different orientations, uh, two uh, deviation vectors will remain during the evolution with different orientations. However, if we take a chaotic orbit and again these two deviation vectors with different orientations, because of the stretching of the asymptotic manifolds, these two deviation vectors will become aligned, parallel. Okay? So, Sally should go to zero for chaotic orbits and should, be, should hold a non-zero value for regular orbits. However, th this definition is a little bit difficult to apply in GR. We, can, we don't have the Euclidean norm to set this to unity, this W to unity. So we need another kind of definition. Uh, this definition is this one, and basically says, calculates, if you want, the area, the surface between the two deviation vectors. And by this, you can understand that if we stretch in the phase space something along the uh, maximal Lagunov characteristic exponent, it uh, will get aligned. But if the surface is on a torus, it will just oscillate a little bit, a little bit but it will remain non-zero. Now, uh, in GR, this is the cross products. Uh, and we have used the two deviation vectors and we normalize them not to unity but to something that will not grow exponentially. So the exponential growth is killed by this uh, square, let's say, by this norm. And thus, we can get this uh, formula by adding these uh, two tensors, which should go to zero if the two deviation vectors become parallel or remain non-zero when uh, the, devi uh, the deviation vectors evolve along a regular orbit. Gali is a generalization of the Sally, and it uh, has many advances which I won't talk about, but it can be generalized in the same way to GR with Sally. We just have to take more of these tensors more of these outer products. And basically, we have seen that all of the chaotic indicators which were defined in uh, classical mechanics, not all the ones I talk about, can be well defined in GR. And they are well behaved. We can uh, discern quite good the chaotic regions from the regular regions, and the response is similar. Basically, none of them can be faster than uh, the characteristic Lakunov time, which is 
when the exponential starts to uh, prevail in the growth of the deviation vector. In order to uh, integrate our regulation of motions, we used uh, IGM, which was designed to evolve strongly chaotic orbits. And initially, we wanted to, uh, to be sublatic. But it is known that when you have uh, adaptive step integration schemes, uh, the symplecticity is not efficient. So we dropped the symplecticity and we, kept, uh, we get only the symmetricity of this integration scheme. And we produced a quite efficient and fast integration scheme. For example, if you want to use Ruke Kuta 5 with a variational step, you will have to wait for certain examples one month. With these schemes, it's just one day. Okay, so it's very fast and quite accurate. It's more accurate than the classical integration schemes. Uh, the test uh, in my work uh, was basically uh, two. The one is to see if everything is fine with the geodesic orbit. So I found that the relative error in the Lagrangian function was quite, uh, quite small. It goes to 10 to minus 12 after uh, 1,000 iterations, 1,000, sorry, uh, Bulgari sections. And it follows a power law which is correlated with uh, round up errors because of the uh, calculations. And then I uh, was concerned about the accuracy of the deviation geodesic and made two tests. These are constraints which should be hold along the evolution of the orbit of the equations. And again, you get uh, power laws which are, in the worst case, uh, goes to 10 to minus 8 under, after 1,000 durations. Uh, one thing that I should warn you about the code is that we are, we are usually uh, renormalizing the deviation vector because it grows and it gets very na large numbers. And because we don't want to handle very large numbers in our simulations, we want to keep them small. So we renormalize quite often the deviation vector. But in this scheme, you are concerned also about the very small deviation vectors. Because if the deviation vector is very small, then IGM will underestimate uh, the the importance of the evolution of the deviation geodesics. So you, can, you have to re-normalize, make the deviation vectors bigger in order to keep a balance between the evolution of the geodesic uh, equation and the deviation uh, geodesic equations. To summarize, by following Sota et al, we redefined uh, these four uh, indicators of chaos. And we have shown that these reformulated forms are uh, equally competent in finding chaos as their corresponding uh, classical uh, counterparts and uh, that they are equally fast if we compare them. So, thank you.